All right, everybody, how are we doing? Sam here, United People's TV, and, and I hope this will be a, an insightful uh, and interesting chat. Uh, I've been joined, thank you very much, today by Samuel Marsden from ESPN and also the creator of Siempre Positiva, a fantastic Barcelona podcast, just in case. I've got, I'm glad, I've got the name right. But look, we're here to talk about Frankie de Jong. You might be slightly bored of talking about Frankie, Frankie de Jong or hearing about it, but it's it's... You can't ignore it. He clearly is Eric Ten Hag's number one target this summer. And it's just, it's Manchester United's fault, really, for going after a player at Barcelona, a, a club where, well, somehow they make Manchester United look like we're run properly. Like They're a club that's in financial dire straits, a club that's restructured everything. What I'm going to speak about with Samuel today is the consequences of this uh, general assembly that happened yesterday. Uh, Barcelona... We're seeing figures of six, seven hundred, eight hundred million being raised. All of a sudden, Barcelona is saved. But how does that actually affect Barcelona and their budget this summer? So, Samuel, I really appreciate you uh, for coming on here today, buddy. Thanks for inviting me on, Sam. Pleasure to be here. And yeah, lots to talk about. Like you said, I mean, there's always stuff to talk about with Barcelona and Man United. There can't be two more sort of, um, I don't know what the word is to put it nicely or not, but two more sort of. Polemica is the word here in Spain, but just clubs constantly generating news stories or transfer stories or, or controversies. Uh, and, and not always in the right way, not at the moment anyway, but it's, it's two, two clubs that want to get back to where they were, I think is probably the best way to describe us at the moment. But yesterday, so with this Frankie de Jong situation, Manchester United, have been, Eric Ten Hag has obviously identified him as a number one target. Frankie de Jong's always maintained that he's been very happy at the club and that Barcelona don't particularly want to sell him. Now, he only completed, I believe, a third of the game under Xavi last season. So he's not exactly a complete mainstay in that team. But effectively, the only reason, as far as United fans are concerned, and know that De Jong will leave is to do with finances. So what can you tell us about this general assembly that happened yesterday, where I believe Barcelona's uh, board members, I'm not sure how to describe them, uh, they agreed to sell off minority stakes in the merchandising and also in 25%, I believe, of the TV rights. So what does that mean in terms of cash influx to Barcelona? Does that completely save the club and transform their debt? I guess the first thing to say is it doesn't save them just yet because all the all the vote on Thursday at General's Assembly on Thursday was about was about authorising the board to, to do these deals. So they've not done these deals yet. I mean, obviously, they say and they tell us that they've got, you know, advanced negotiations with several sort of investment funds or companies in place. But, you know, these deals are not done yet. This isn't money that they've got all of a sudden. But they do now have the, the right, as you say, to, to pursue these deals. It was voted on by, by the club's members, the socios. 4,000 were, were summoned and were able to vote. Only, only about 600 did, but they passed those deals. So they can now pursue these deals. Joanne Laporta, the president, says that for a 49.9% stake in, in the club's merchandising rights, they expect to bring in between sort of 200 and 300 million. And for the TV rights, they expect to bring in 100, uh, 200 million for every 10%. So if you go up to 25%, which is what they've got the authorization to sell, then they will bring in around sort of 500 million for that if they were to do that all in, in one go. Um, and in contrast, they lose 25%, obviously, of their, their La Liga television rights, which on last season's income, or 2021, 2020-21, they made 160 million. So it's about 40 million a year they're going to be losing for the next sort of 25 years in exchange for this, this fix now. So, yeah, that's the sort of the hard cash and the basis of the assembly um, on Thursday. Um, and yeah, obviously, a lot of the headlines and the social media lines will be, you know, Barca have got this influx of cash or can have this influx of cash come in and in the next few weeks. But it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have, you know, this. they're still in a tricky financial situation. They've still got debt problems to solve. They still need to plug sort of somewhere between 100 and 200 million in the accounts this year to avoid ending the year with with losses, which obviously feeds into their La Liga fair play. So this isn't Barca are saved. This is Barca are in a better position now this summer than they would have been without these deals. Um, but it could come with a cost in, in the long term in terms of long term revenue. Now, the, the thing that I I would like to get some more insight into is so we, we've got that cash influx now. How does that affect their transfer budget this summer? Because as far as I know, because uh, it's quite hard to understand everything that's going on. The club's transfer budget as it stands is in negative. Uh, it's about, about 100 minus 144 million euros as far as I know. How did they? Is it a case of June the thirtieth being the deadline on the profit and loss accounts that this cash influx has to happen before that deadline in order to change that number in order to then give Barcelona the finances they want to go after the likes of Lewandowski, or go after Kunde, go after I don't know they've been linked with tons of players but they can't do it at the moment can they? 
Yeah, well, there's, there's kind of two things at play here. So the first thing is internally the club can't register or if the club keep registering losses, there's a chance that, you know, the, the members can sort of vote, can sort of call a vote against the board if there's losses for a certain amount of years. I mean, it's slightly complicated because it's a new board and because the previous losses for the last three years were under a different board, although technically last year was their losses, but they were only in charge for half a season. So there's this, there's this internal element where they can't close the, the financial year with, with losses because of the way they're run by the members. And also, you know, the club talk a lot about, you know, to get this sort of funding for people to invest in the club, if they're registering losses, the, the value of the club. So, so they've projected that they won't make a losses. So if they then make losses, it brings the value of the club down, the value of all the deals down. So there's that side of things. The La Liga side of things is slightly different in terms of the fair play. And it's quite hard to, to get a grip of, really, because it's not just based on hard numbers it's based on projected numbers as well so the most important thing is they don't need necessarily the 700 million right now but they need to cover the gap so they don't end this year with losses and then they need these deals and these deal sheets to show to La Liga that this is what our projected earnings are for 22-23 and this is why because we've got this 500 million coming in or whatnot and these different things and La Liga take that into into account when they then calculate the revised spending limits but even with this all considered it's going to be very very difficult for Barca to get back on into a situation not where they can spend but where they can just spend what they say so at the moment because like you say they've got a negative spending cap which is unheard of in my time covering la liga um it went down to 97 million i mean it used to be around 500 600 million it went down to 97 million at the start of the season now like you say it's negative which is hard to explain in itself how they can have a negative cap um so yeah they need to basically get that back up to a level which is on a par with their outgoings, which is 560 million a year at the moment in wages and amortization payments on, on transfer fees. So to get back to a one, one-on-one sort of um, situation is the, the aim really. And then once they're there, anything that leaves sort of, so if they sell Frankie de Jong and you know, they lose his 50 million wages a year or whatever it is, they can then add someone to their squad who's earning 50 million a year. But as things are at the moment, if they were to sell Frankie de Jong now, his 15 million a year would factor into this one to three thing. So they could then only register 5 million of that until they're back within their La Liga spending cap. And I, I, th- I think that's the really interesting point to understand for United fans is if they were to sell Frankie de Jong right this second, it wouldn't be worth anywhere near as much to them as if they sold Frankie de Jong in, uh, after they've agreed this sort of financial situation. Is that correct? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it a case of it suits Barcelona to wait a bit longer as well with de Jong? Uh, what what are the noises that you're hearing from your side? Obviously, you're covering Barcelona because from, from the outside looking in, all we've heard and we've seen Frank de Jong, especially in that interview that he gave with Holland saying, look, I'm at the best club of the world. You know, th- there's no news from my angle. He seems very happy and settled, but there's a lot of noise that keeps coming out from Spain and from Barcelona side of things that the club are prepared to sell him. Yeah, I mean, on the first question in terms of whether it would be better to wait or not, I mean, there are, again so many complicated financial elements at play, one being sort of, you know, how much they paid for Frankie de Jong. And, you know, if they were to then sell him for 60 million, it could almost be counterproductive because the way it sort of works out on the accounting sheets, they'd be registering sort of a loss and it could could further hit them aside from the sort of the wage element. Um, So, yeah, in that sense, maybe if things, if they're in a better financial situation, if they then sold, it wouldn't be such a big hit. And the wages would obviously be able to be covered 1v1 if they were back into this 1v1 situation, hypothetically. But in terms of, Frankie de Jong's future, just ignoring all that financial side of things. Like you say, there's been a strong current of information coming out of the club for for quite a while now. They've sort of been laying this ground groundwork, I guess you would say, for or or at least sort of creating the idea and getting the idea out there to see the reaction, which is something Barca do a lot of in the in the local media to see how socios or the media or people would react to selling Frankie de Jong um, for a couple of reasons. Obviously, the main reason being financially in in one sense even though the the vice president for finance Eduardo Romeo has played down this idea that they need to sell anyone strictly for money I think Javi has said two or three times now towards the end of last season that you know he likes Frankie he counts on Frankie but there's also a financial situation that needs to be considered so even if it's not strictly financial it does come down to you know priorities is is Frankie a priority for Javi and when you look at the midfield Frankie would rather play in that sort of deeper role, whether that's his best role or not. Busquets is there, even though Busquets is coming up to the end of his, perhaps this will be his last season at Barca, he's still going to be a fixed starter. And then you've got Pedri and Gavi ahead of him, players who who Barca couldn't sell, you know, because they would be up for, especially if they sold Pedri at the moment or Gavi because of because of what they mean to the club. So so Frankie de Jong's kind of the, the odd one out of those four in terms of, I mean, Busquets doesn't have a value now, but in terms of the players that Barca have, 
who have a transfer value. Frankie de Jong, they've kind of decided is the only one that they would or could listen to offers for and and, and could sell. Um, like you say, Frankie de Jong's been quite clear that he would prefer to stay at Barcelona. That's long been the message coming from from Frankie de Jong. But we've seen this before at Barca where they turn the tide on players. It happened with Arto Melo, who's a um, midfielder at Juventus, who didn't want to leave. And it was the same thing. They laid the fountain the groundwork, stories started to come out. I mean, you'll never get stories like this about Frankie because he's such an impeccable professional, but, you know, about perhaps Arthur's attitude or perhaps his life off the pitch, just laying the laying the groundwork for his departure. And, you know, right up until his departure to Juventus was confirmed, he was sort of like, I want to stay, I want to stay. His um, agents were sending sort of not, not off the record messages, they were sending messages that you could publish sort of as statements from them or from Arthur saying, I want to stay. In the end, he left. I mean, and the same happened with Emerson Royale last summer. The day before he signed to Tottenham, his agent was still saying the priority is to stay at stay at Barcelona. But in the end, these players have been pushed out. I mean, Frankie de Jong's a different case in that he's, you know, very much a star player, very much someone with a big value. You know, Arthur was perhaps dropping out of the team at the time. Emerson Royale wasn't guaranteed a place in the team. But, you know, th- there comes a moment where you have to imagine... And, you know, as far as I'm aware, it's not, it's not come yet. I mean, I know some stories are saying that where Frankie thinks, well, hang on, do I really want to stay here? I mean, obviously he loves life in the city. His dream has been to play for Barcelona. But when the club are leaking so many stories and doing so many other things, you have to wonder what, what he would be thinking seeing all this. Um, Matt, you, you, you've touched on it quite a lot there. I, I suppose that is the Barcelona way. And I think that something that's a little bit different of Barcelona compared to other clubs is it it's effectively a political entity at the same time. You know, you have to keep uh, public opinion happy. You're, you're talking there about stories being leaked to the press and, and how they react to it. But is there a scenario where Xavi and Barcelona fans and the club goes into next season happy with Frankie de Jong in the squad if that means that other signings aren't made? Because this is the first... Full, it's first full summer, isn't it, for Xavi to sort of start this new rebuild? He's always had a very successful period when he came in and replaced. Was it Coman that he replaced? Um, yeah. And he did, and he did very well. But this is where he needs to build his team. Uh, is is that going to be possible if they don't sell Frankie De Jong? Uh, all all, all uh, ignoring De Jong aside, what would the how would Barcelona finance signing the likes of Lewandowski and Kunde? Is it literally a case of these um, economic levers, as they like to be called? Is that enough for them, or do they need do they need to supplement that with selling somebody? If it's not De Jong, then somebody else. Yeah, I mean, I think to sign Lewandowski, I mean, that one's quite far down the line now. I mean, everyone's seen what Lewandowski's had to say. He's made it quite clear. He's not named Barcelona, but he's made it quite clear that there's one club he wants to play for. He's dropped hints about that being a Spanish club. So that one's quite far down the line now. And as as I understand it, it's not dependent on on Frankie De Jong. I mean, it was dependent on these on these financial operations being passed by the by the members on Thursday. It's perhaps dependent on them making a little bit more room in the squad. And that could be things that have perhaps already happened in terms of, you know, Luke de Jong going back to Sevilla from his loan, Adam Atriori going back to Wolves, and then perhaps other sort of things that are in the off, off in that are going to happen. You know, Francisco Chilincao perhaps going to sport in Lisbon, um, little play, players like that, you know, Ricky Poe, Josca Mingate, they're just more making sort of space in the squad. I think they can do enough now from the position they're in and perhaps with, you know, wage cuts are also being talked about again with, you know, PK and Busquets. Um, so I think the, the Lewandowski deal would not be dependent on Frankie de Jong. But if you're looking to sign, and it sounds crazy given the financial financial situation, but if you're looking to sign Bernardo Silva, um, then that one, from my point of view, only happens if Frankie de Jong is sold. Um, Kunde doesn't make any sense either in a way. I mean, it makes in terms of him being a great player, it makes sense. But in terms of Barca's defensive pitch, you know, they've just renewed Ronald Araujo. They're signing Andres Christensen from Chelsea, who they can't register yet, even though they've complete, not officially announced the signing, but the agreement is in place for him to join for free. They've got PK, who's still got a contract for another two years. They've got Eric Garcia, who only joined from Manchester City last year, who's not going to be going anywhere. Then they've got Clement Longley and Samuel Mtiti, who they still need to get rid of. So from my point of view, you know, on a, on that sort of level, Kunde is still a long way off. You know, Lenglet has to go, Kunde has to go, uh, Kunde, sorry, Umtiti has to go. And then you've still got, with Kunde, five centre-backs. Is Javi going to play three at the back? Um, so, yeah, the Kunde one is difficult to find find that money. You'd imagine beyond Lewandowski and perhaps, you know, free transfers, whether they go for Di Maria to replace Dembele, if Dembele leaves, you know, if it has Pili Cueta or Alonso from Chelsea for cheap. But beyond that... You'd imagine that f- sales aren't necessary, but if they want to want to sign a Kunde or a Bernardo Silva, you'd imagine it would be dependent on on some big sales, yeah, whether it's Memphis Depay, Serginio Dest, Frankie De Jong, whoever that may be. Um, and uh, with the, with Barcelona from from a financial perspective, is is it the wages which are 
just as big a hurdle as the idea of having money to spend on new players. Uh, so the idea of someone like Frankie de Jong leaving, who's on substantial wages, and getting that off the bill would would make more of a difference. As you say, there's a couple of players that have left yet, but realistically, they haven't really moved the needle that much. Is it a case that they have to take somebody's wages, again, like de Jong, off the bill? Yeah, the wage, the wage that's the big problem, really. I mean, Barca, in theory, could sign... You know, they, they could sign someone for 100 million tomorrow. I mean, it could affect them. They could, you know, in two years, they could be bankrupt because of it. But they could take a sort of a, a, a real big gamble on that financially. And I mean, the thing that's holding the back is, like you say, the A, the La Liga the spending limit, and then B, the wages, as opposed to actually having the access to the money. I mean, there's so many people that would lend them or give them money. It's that wage bill, um, which is 560 million euros. The big, you know, Real Madrid is 400 million. Um, so that's not just the wage bill. So someone like Frankie de Jong is going to be costing them like, not just his wages within that 560 million is factored in the cost of his transfer each year. Um, I don't have the figures to date because he signed a contract renewal, but if he said, I mean, I'm sure, you know, if he signed like a five year deal and he cost a hundred million, then on top of his wages, say 15 million, you factor in 20 million for the each year of the, the transfer. And it's sort of a 35 million cost on the, on the books. Um, so yeah, I mean, moving on someone like Frankie de Jong who cost with add-ons around sort of 80 million euros plus his wages is going to sort of take a lot off, of that sort of um, a wage bill, but to get they need they need wage cuts. They need to move on players that are on big salaries, like on TT, like Lenglet, who just don't play. Um, and that's the thing that's really, really holding them back. They need to. It's incredible that it's still at 560 million, really, when you think of the players that have left in recent years who would have been on huge salaries: Messi, Griezmann, Luis Suarez, Arturo Vidal, Ivan Rakitic, and they've still got this 560 million. I mean, there's I don't know if there's a better word for it than wage bill because it's not just wages, but this, this these outgoings every year. Um, yeah, that's the big, big handicap for them at the moment and the main thing they're working on. That's why they're working on further salary cuts with, with Pique and Busquets. The problem they've got and the reason it is so high is because they've kept kicking the can down the road. So when COVID started, they agreed rather than specific pay cuts, they were more sort of deferred wages, thinking the things would clear up and obviously they've not cleared up. So now you've got a situation where players like Pique, Busquets, Jordi Alba, lots of players within the squad are sort of on weight on on contracts where last year they didn't earn so much but it means this year they're earning more or they're owed a lot of money down the line in certain situations so that's what they need to get on top of that wasn't that situation they did as well with Aubameyang and that's the reason why they were able to sign him because they offered him less at the start and then it's going to get off he's going to get more as it goes down the line exactly yeah so Aubameyang obviously joined for free last season was paid was paid very very little because obviously he came through on on deadline day and they had very little money to spend within their wage cap but that means that now this year his salary increases um, and then he's got, I mean, his contract is until 2025 technically with those wages including, but if they've got an option to cancel it in 2023, but that would obviously come with a, a penalty, a financial penalty for the club well, if they were to cancel the deal earlier. I mean, just to, just to ask you one, one final question here, Samuel, like, according to, you know, everything that you know, all the, all the people that you've talked to inside Barcelona, would you say there's more confidence that, that Frankie de Jong will stay rather than leave? Or do you think that the way that it has gone so far, you're seeing a lot of parallels with, you talk, You mentioned Art, Art, Artem Milo and other players that have been slowly sort of shown the exit door. Is, it, is that the most likely scenario, you think, this summer for Frankie de Jong? I think that if you, if you listen to everything that's come out of Barcelona, the most likely scenario is that Frankie de Jong leaves, yeah. Um, if there's a club that can, can match his, match his, ask, his asking price and, and pay his wages... I think there was um, a hope from from Barcelona, perhaps, that there would be more interest from other clubs in terms of spurring on the fee, perhaps, you know, whether Paris Saint-Germain would get involved or at one time if Manchester City. Uh, I mean, I know Bayern Munich have been linked, but I don't think Bayern Munich are a club that are ever really likely to sort of get involved in a sort of massive, massive bidding war. Um, and I think, if not Frankie de Jong, who's obviously been very focused on Barcelona, I think perhaps his, his, his camp, his agents would have perhaps liked... A little bit more interest to materialise. I mean, if you think back six, I think about six months. I think his dad said, his dad said all five of Europe, he didn't name them, but he said five, all five of Europe's biggest clubs would love to sign Frankie De Jong. But we haven't seen that this summer when Barca have made it so obvious that he is available. So we we'll see what happens. I don't know if it's a case of others just waiting to see what happens. I don't know. I mean, I know exchange deals never happen. I don't know if City and Barca would cook up something for Bernardo and and Frankie De Jong because obviously Bernardo would love to come to to Barcelona I don't know if United will end up being the only option um, and yeah I mean I think this is just sort of guesswork really but I think Frankie de Jong is probably more open I mean as we've seen with the reports I guess more open to being you know the central part of a United project of being loved 
than perhaps he would have been, you know, when these first, these sort of stories, this first interest came out, you know, May, April time. Um, so yeah, I really, I, I really don't, don't, don't know what to say. But I mean, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of, because a lot of the times you say these things and before you know it, aggregators are saying, yeah, Sam Miles, that- Sam Miles says 100% Frankie de Jong, this, this or that. Um, so I, was, I, I don't know. I mean, the, just based on what I see from other reports, because if, if I would, if I just were to go on everything that I've been told from people close to Frankie throughout the summer, I'd be leaning towards him staying. But obviously, and the longer this goes on, and the more Barca push for him to leave, the more you imagine he will perhaps open up to leaving. So I would, I would, if I had to predict now whether he will stay or go, I would probably be leaning towards go. Hey, see, the, the fact that you sort of you were so tentative there it kind of goes to show the, the complications that are involved in this. It's not as simple as if you maybe it is as simple as that now. If United were to pay a fee that Barcelona want, they'd be like, okay, good, all right, gone. But up until this point, it's been like juggling, it's been involved in the finances, it's been involved in the politics of it all, and it's made it a bit of a, a convoluted situation. It's a bit like when Man United tried to sign uh, Jaden Sancho from Borussia Dortmund, and they had no intention of selling uh, unless it was for a ridiculous fee, and we waited all summer long. Uh, but United, I suppose, are just we're sitting here jealously in the Premier League watching City sign Haaland, Liverpool sign Nunes and thinking, well, we finished 35 points and 34 points behind those two last season and they've gone out and signed those. We need to get things done. But look, Sam, I really, really do appreciate your time today, man. Um, I will leave a link to your podcast and a link to the to your Twitter account in the comments as well. So anybody, if you want to reach out to Sam for some more information, which I'm sure there will be, because as I said, the 30th of June is when the, the accounts get done. Let's see if Barcelona can get those deals over the line and, and more money comes in. Unfortunately, I can see this one dragging out a little bit longer. I would love it to be resolved quickly, but the way it's gone, I think it's going to keep getting drip, drip fed into whatever this whole situation emerges. Hopefully it ends with De Jong in the United shirt, but I don't think anybody can say anything with any real confidence whether De Jong's going to stay or De Jong's going to leave. As you say there, it's a bit it kind of who you listen to, right? But as I said, Sam, appreciate your time today man uh, and thank you very much and i hope you have a good weekend hey eh? no worries you too cheers sam right. enjoy the Take weather it easy, buddy also great yes. name by the way i didn't say that great name <laughs> <laughs> see you later